Good morning, Church. I know that many of us have been affected, whether directly or indirectly, by our ongoing battle with COVID-19. And I am sure that we are bombarded daily by thoughts of anxiety and hopelessness. We long for the day wherein we do not have to fear for the safety of our loved ones and ourselves. News and opinions surround us, and it's becoming hard to tune out what is not true. But we can be sure of this one truth, that there is still one in whom we can find rest. He is our healer, our provider, our God victorious, our Prince of Peace, sovereign over all. Before we proceed to singing our songs, let me share with you verses from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
glory and grace His word shall not fail you He promised Believe Him and all will be well Then go to a world that is dying His perfect salvation to tell Right.
worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here touching every heart. I worship you. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I That is who you are. 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 That is who you
is who you are. That is who you are. Good morning, Church. Welcome to Lighthouse of Faith, Domenico. Today, we are very happy that you can once again join us for our worship service this morning. Why don't we come to the Lord in prayer once again this morning? Father, we thank you, Father, for this morning that we could come together. We thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you, Father, for your provisions. We thank you, Father, for your protection, O Lord. Indeed, Father, we are blessed because you are a God who never gives up on us. You are a God who continues to see us through. Father, with all our shortcomings, we thank you because your grace is more than enough for us. Father, we continue to come before your presence, Father, to give you glory, to give you honor, because indeed, Father, you deserve all this. In everything that is going on, Father, it just proves that you have been right all along. And we just simply submit to your will as we humbly come before your presence, acknowledging that indeed we have a holy God, a God who is perfect and can never be mistaken. And if anything is wrong, Father, it is usually with our thinking, with our faith. A lot of times, Father, it is because of our pride. And Father, this morning, we just want to come before your presence to once again acknowledge that you are good, that you are right, that you are perfect, that you know what's, what you are doing, O oh Lord, even when we don't. And that's why, Father, this morning, we just want to give you thanks and we want to worship you because indeed, we are standing before a God beyond our imagination. A God who is so beautiful, so powerful, so awesome that our simple minds could not even begin to understand. And that's why, Father, this morning, we just want to continue to lift our Father this morning and each one of us into your hands. Bless us, Father, as we come to worship you and continue to help us to be in awe of you, who you are. Even this morning as we come together to worship you, remind us that we are not just standing before anybody, but we are standing before our Creator, our Great I Am. And we don't even deserve to be in your presence. But it's only by your grace, it is only by, because of the cross that we are able to come boldly into your throne of grace. We commit each one of us into your hands, Father, this morning. Once again, we ask that you'd speak to each one of us, O Lord. We pray, Father, for your grace, for your Holy Spirit to work in us and through us, that as we come to your word, your word would once again challenge us to be better Christians, that your word would once again challenge us to live a life that is pleasing before your sight. Father, we lift up, Father, our church into your hands. Indeed, Father, as we begin to see many of our church members and our relatives who have been affected, Father, by um, the COVID-19, we pray, Father, for your grace and for your mercy once more, O oh Lord. We plead you, Father, to continue to, to touch our, our, our members, our, our relatives, Father, with your healing hands. Father, we want to lift up specially in prayer our um, sister Ida, even as she is now confined in the ICU and doing much better. We pray, Father, for complete recovery, and we pray, Father, hopefully that this week she would be allowed to go home. Father, we pray even, Father, for the sister of Auntie Luz, who is just at the, um, near the onset of the symptoms that um, accompanies COVID-19. We pray, Father, for her, even as her oxygen is going down, and even for um, the health care um, that she needs, Father, especially because she couldn't find a hospital room and will only be quarantined at home. We pray, Father, for your grace and for your mercy to be upon Eden, O oh Lord. We pray, Father, for your healing touch, that indeed, Father, you would continue to um, be the one, Father, to 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 be, you. You'd be his. You would be her doctor, O oh Lord, in these times of crisis. Father, once again, we continue to pray, Father, for our country, even as we continue to see. Numbers rising, O oh Lord. This Friday, we just have 12,000, more than 12,000 COVID new cases. And we just ask, Father, for your mercy upon our country. Because indeed, our country needs your grace, needs your mercy, needs your intervention so much. And we just lift up, Father, this country into your hands. 
We pray, Father, once again for our government officials, even in the midst of all this, Father. Continue to give them wisdom. Continue to guide every step of the way, O Lord. Give them um, the desire to, to help the people that they are serving, O Lord. We continue to pray, Father, for Christian brothers and sisters to rise up, to take up the slack, Father, of um, that needs to be do, to be done, Father, in this community where the government is failing. I pray, Father, that our Christian brothers and sisters will continue to act with compassion, with sacrifice, especially for those who are suffering, that we would continue to show what Christian love is all about, Lord, especially in these times of crisis. Once again, Father, I commit this morning into your hands. I continue to pray, Father, for our message this morning. Let your spirit work in us and through us and continue to be um, to let your word uh, dwell richly in our hearts, Father, as we come to your word. Once again, Father, we pray that our worship may be acceptable before your sight. Remind us that we are standing before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that we are to have a heart, a, an attitude, Father, of reverence and uh, an awareness of your presence throughout. Once again, Father, I give you thanks. I give you all the glory. Be with us, Father, this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Once again, good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, our message will, is entitled, Bare Essentials. Bare Essentials. And our passage is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Before we go on, allow me to introduce Bill Vukovic to each and every one of you. Bill Vukovic was the Michael Jordan of car racing. Before there were ever Formula One racing, there was what they call the World Drivers' Championship. And if there is one name that stands high above every other name, it would be that of Bill Vukovic. He only had a five-year career, but in the span of those five-year career, he finished two years champion as a champion. Five years and he got two years as a champion. And not only that, but until this very day, he still holds the record of leading 71.7% of all laps that he competed in. All the laps that he competed in, 71.7% of those laps, he was always on the lead. And no one even comes close to his record of 71.7%. In an interview, he was asked, what's your secret? What's your secret in winning a car race? And he answered by saying, what secret? There's no secret. You simply press the accelerator to the floor. You step on it. And when you step on it, you win. That's all there is to it. And what Bill Vukovic essentially did was he stripped down car racing to its bare minimum. If you're going to take everything away, the one thing that matters the most in car racing is that you have to step on the pedal of your accelerator or else you will never get to the finish line. That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. That's what's important with car racing. Now, when we come to the church, we need to ask that very same question. What are the bare essentials within a church? Is it church building? Do we have to build beautiful, big churches in order for us to be considered a church? How about praise and worship? Should we have good music? Of course, good music is good. Um, but is it essential to a church? How about programs and activities? Today, we have so many activities and programs in our churches. Um, uh, camps, retreats, seminars. We have so many activities within the church, but are all these things essential? And when we talk about essential, we're saying the most important integral part of what makes a church a church. Let me... Let me say that all this, all this list are very important. They are very important, some more important than the others. But ultimately, are this what makes a church a church? If we are to strip away all the non-essentials, what would remain in the church? 
What would remain in a church when you take away all the non-essentials? What would the church strip of all non-essentials look like? I believe to find our answer, we need to go back to the very beginning of how the church began. I believe we have to go back to the very beginning of how the church actually began. Okay? And that's why we're going to look at um, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. If you have your Bibles with you, I challenge you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, starts by saying these words, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as he had needed. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, before we go on, let's try to look at the context of Acts chapter 2. When we come to Acts chapter 2 from verse 1, we understand that it was actually the, 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 the event of Pentecost. Pentecost is basically 50 days after the Passover. Remember Jesus, he was crucified um, on Passover. And it was 50 days after Passover. And it was, in the, it was during, on, during Pentecost that the church was actually formed or was actually born. Um, it was when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in power in the form of tongues of fire that the church actually began. The apostles who were once very cowardly suddenly grew the strength, went out into the streets and started preaching about Jesus Christ when in fact they were very fearful for their lives just a few weeks ago. But after Pentecost, or during Pentecost for that matter, they were very bold. They go out and start preaching the gospel. They start telling people about Jesus Christ. And if you go on and reading, you will actually find that <coughs> after the Holy Spirit came upon them, we find Peter's first sermon. In fact, this was the very first sermon preach uh, from the church, okay? It was the very first Christian message that was preached by someone other than Jesus Christ, and it was preached by the Apostle Peter. And the Bible tells us that that day that the Apostle Peter preached, almost 3,000 people came to know the Lord that very day. You see, this was basically just the day the church was born. What follows is the passage that we read a while ago. Basically, the church was just beginning. No traditions, no rituals, no creed, no culture. They don't have practices yet at this point. No traditions, it's just beginning. Wala pa silang sinusundan na mga traditions na sinusundan natin today. They don't have practices yet. They don't have rituals that we have today. In fact, they don't even have any creed yet. Remember, we um, in church, we used to memorize Apostles' Creed. During their time, they don't have the creed yet. They don't have any form of creed yet. It was new. It was just simply beginning. And like any other organizations at the very start, it was simply moving forward with the bare minimum or what we call the bare essentials. It was the church strip of everything unessential. It was the very beginning and therefore what they had is what the church is all about. What they had at that point is what the church is all about. 
Okay? Let's go to the passage. The passage starts by telling us that they devoted themselves. The word devoted comes from the Greek word proskar, proskartereo. Proskartereo. Okay? Proskartereo literally means steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. Take time to think about those definitions. Steadfast meaning it's unshakable. They, they, they're not even doubting what they are doing. They're single-minded. They're focused. And they were, they were loyal. Fidelity. They were loyal to a certain course of action. They understood this to be the truth. They believed in what they were doing. They were invested in what they were doing. And they have... You have to understand that at this point, they have just simply... They have just seen the Lord raised from the dead 50 days prior. Jesus Christ was just raised from the dead about 50 days ago. And they have just been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so if you, if you take time to think about it, you understand that they were very passionate. They knew this is true and this is what they were called to do. And they wanted to do, they wanted to do what was important. What was most essential? And they knew what was essential. If we go to our passage today, we will find the Bible telling us what they devoted themselves to. They were devoted, they were focused, they were unshakable about this basic or bare essentials or the bare minimum of what makes a church a church. Now let's ask this very important question. What are the bare essentials? Well, the first thing that the Bible tells us that the apostles, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Now understand what, it, what we mean when we talk about they devoted themselves to apostles' teachings. Well, first, it tells us that they focus on learning the truth. They focus on learning the truth. Now we have to remember that during the time of the New Testament, especially during this first century church, there was still no complete Bible yet. The Bible has not yet been have, have not just not yet been compiled together. At this point, they only have the Old Testament, and they don't actually have a copy of the Old Testament because during those time, to have a scroll of the Scripture is actually very expensive. The papyrus is expensive. The hiring of a scribe to write down the Scriptures is also very expensive, and that's why during those times. Not many of them can afford to have a Bible at home, to have an old, a copy of the Old Testament at home. And so, people at the time, they really don't know much and except for what is thought of them. Secondly, we have to understand that many of them were coming from a Jewish background. They were taught according to Jewish traditions. And now that they became Christians, they understood that there is a very significant difference between the Jewish culture and the Christianity. And basically, growing up being a Jew, they have to relearn certain things. And they have to relearn what the Pharisees could not understand. And so they have to rely somewhere for the truth. And, they, and at this point, the apostles were the best teachers that they had because the apostles... They were with Jesus for three and a half years. They were first-hand witnesses of Jesus Christ. They learned at the foot of Jesus Christ. They are our they were their best source of information at this time. And that's why the Bible tells us that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They were not devoted to what's new, what's novel. Diba? Yan yung problema sa atin today. Because today, kung anong uso, anong bago, we run after those things. Purpose-driven life, purpose-driven church, Jabez, a prayer of Jabez. We keep running after all these things kasi uso, kasi bago. But for them, they understood that what they have to focus on is what the apostles learned from Jesus Christ himself. It was the first-hand information and they were going back to those first-hand information. Today, we don't have the apostles here with us, 
but we have the writings in the scriptures. We have now our complete Bible. We have the New Testament, which the apostles themselves put into writing. And the question, and, and of course, for us today, when we talk about focusing on the apostles' teaching, it is to read the scriptures, to know our scriptures, to focus on learning the Bible. Look at what it goes on to mean. Not only were they focused on learning the truth, but it was the very first thing that they devoted themselves to. When the gospel, when the when the book of Acts was written, Luke especially put apostles' teaching as one of the first things they devoted themselves to. Why is this important? Look at the passage again. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 43. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And here's what I want to point out. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. They never devoted themselves to wonders and miraculous signs. And dami, many, many wonders were abounding throughout those times. The apostles were doing miracles left and right. If you go through the book of Acts, you will find a lot of miracles recorded there. But in spite of all those miracles, they were never asked to devote themselves. In fact, they never devoted themselves to pursuing miracles, signs, and wonders. They focus on one thing and one thing alone. They focus on the truth. And that's all there was. They focus on the truth. They were unshaken with their pursuit of the truth. Why? Well, the third thing we want to, to, to remind ourselves is that the apostles' teaching, it, is, it was very important. It was very important. Look at the passage again. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it tells us that those who accepted the message of Peter were baptized, and about 3,000 of them were added, to, were added to their number that day. Imagine, if you have a church, and suddenly, just one day, you have 3,000 new converts. How would you feel? How would you feel? Most of our churches would become very, very busy with so many activities lined up for these new converts. But look at what the apostles did. In spite of the 3,000 new converts, they never detracted from what is important. They focused on what is important. They focused on the truth. They focused on the apostles' teaching. They could have an organizational charts to categorize these new converts. But you know what? Activities and even miracles cannot transform lives. Sooner or later, if you continue to focus on activities, it will lose its luster. Kung puro activities ka lang one day, it will just be another ritual. Now it may seem new to you, it may seem new to a lot of people, and they may be excited about these activities. But sooner or later, it will just be yet another ritual. And it becomes a bore to them. Miracles is the same way. If you have one or two miracles sprouting here and there, it's something that we get excited about. But if everywhere you look is full of miracles, left and right, suddenly be miracles becomes a norm. And when it becomes a norm, it ceases to amaze people anymore. It ceases to amaze people anymore. And that's why the Bible never tells us to run after miracles, never run after wonders. Rather, go to the truth. Why? Because it is not Miracles, it is not activities that transform the lives of people. It is the truth, and only the truth, that can transform our lives. Look at Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6 verse 1, the Bible says, In those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Grecian Jews among them were complaining. The Grecian Jews, basically, these were, um, Jews, who, these were Jews who came from Greece, or probably from Rome, and they came to Israel, and they were among the Hebrew, the Hebraic Jews. And guess what? Because they were outsiders, when they came to town, and 
when these Hebrew Jews were distributing food for Christians, and who, or for people who are in need of food, remember during this time, they had a very bad a famine affecting Jerusalem. And so these Christians, they were distributing food for those who need food. And these Grecian Jews, they were complaining that their widows were being neglected with the distribution of the food. They, they were not receiving any food. Right? Yeah, um, we, we know this very well because especially during this time of pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic, right? um, we are afraid of traveling to another another locality for fear na pag nagbigay ng sap, we might not be able to get any sap in another locality because basically to them we are outsiders. So we stay in our own locality, hoping that we could receive um, the social amelioration fund from our own LGU. Because if we go to another LGU, they won't entertain us because we are outsiders to them. That's true here. The Hebraic Jew, probably because of so many people, they are, I believe it was not intentional, but in the process of distributing food, they were neglecting nakakalimutan the widows who are who belong to the Grecian Jews now look at what happened next so the 12 when they heard about this they gathered together all the disciples and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables the 12 understood one very important principle yes we can continue doing the distribution of food to the widows. Um, they are hungry. Yes, distributing of food to widows is very important. And if we are to delegate this work to others, there's a chance that these people who will be doing this work might not do it as well as we are doing. Diba? Yun yung palaging problema ng delegation. Eh? You're afraid that when you delegate something, it might not be done well. It might not be done properly. They were afraid of that. And you know, there's the possibility. There's the possibility that if we delegate the distribution of food to someone else, they might not do it as well as we do. But if the apostles do not teach... You see, no one else will be able to teach because the apostles were the ones who understood the truth. They were the ones who were with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. You see, the, the others can act as waiters, maybe not as good as the apostles are doing. Others can lead in singing, maybe not as heavenly as the apostles are doing. But at least they get the job done because the apostles, if they are to do all these things, they will not be able to teach the truth anymore. My sisters, that's why I want to remind each one of us. In the church, there are some who are called to be teachers. And the main job of teachers is to teach. They have the gift of teaching. And as much as we want them to be involved in other ministries, but the moment these teachers and pastors, for that matter, become so busy with trivial activities. Yes, they may be important, they may be crucial to the church, but if they use up their time doing all these other things, chances are they won't have much time in preparing their messages. And when they don't have time to prepare for their messages, they would not be able to give a good message, and the members of the church will not actually grow. And in the end, the whole church suffers. My sisters, understand that in the church, we are given different tasks to do. Some of us, we are called to teach. And when these people are called to teach, help them in other ministries. Don't allow them to be overworked so that they come to the point that they have to neglect the preparation of the Word of God. That's true not just for pastors, not just for Bible study leaders, but even for Sunday school teachers and even for those who are leading in songs, singing. A lot of times, singing songs, as I have already mentioned, over and over again. Minsan nagiging uh, parang karaoke tayo, diba? We sing songs, but we don't actually bring new insights. We don't actually 
talk about the songs that we are singing. Why? Because we don't get to prepare. In our business, we don't get to prepare. And basically, everything suffers. The church suffers. The apostles, they understood. Let's sacrifice everything else. They might not be able to do the job well, but at least they get the job done. They, they get to, the job gets done, even though they don't get to do it well. But at least tayo, we can focus on what's important. We can focus on preaching and teaching. Because we cannot ne- delegate that work because tayo yung nakakaalam. You see, the apostles, they understood. Teaching and learning is a very important and very crucial part of the church that they had to focus on it. They had to put time and effort into the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Now, why is learning the top priority or the priority? Why is learning first when the Gospel of Luke was written? Why did it put learning first ahead of prayer, ahead of um, fellowship, ahead of breaking of bread? Well, why is learning important? Well, first, it helps us understand our faith better. Remember, this is a new church, and many were new believers. In fact, as we have read a while ago, there were 3,000 new converts. These were new believers who probably don't know much about their faith yet. And therefore, learning is very important at this stage because it helps them be established in their faith that they get to understand what they believe and why they believe what they believe. Because those two things are very important. It's one thing to know what you believe, but it's altogether another thing to know why you believe them. Because one gives you the content, but the other gives you the reason and the motivation to continue believing in them. And that's why the apostle Paul, the apostles, they put a lot of emphasis on learning. It helps us understand our faith. It helps us understand our faith. Secondly, learning is important because it stabilizes us during times of suffering. It stabilizes us during times of suffering. What does the Bible say about suffering? The Bible says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's James chapter 1 verse 2. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because when you go through those, the Bible says, James, the book of James tells us, you develop perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be complete and mature. And the Bible is telling us when we go through sufferings, be joyful. Be joyful because God is actually training you to become something better. Now, here's the problem. If you don't learn the truth before suffering comes, it will be too late. It will be too late when suffering is already present. You see, when people are suffering, you can't come to them and say, you know what, be joyful because God is training you. It's a slap to their face. It's adding salt to the injury. You have to teach them before the suffering comes. It establishes them. You see, learning is very important because it gives us a reason for why we go through suffering. But when we are in the midst of suffering and you are taking that opportunity to learn this lesson, it's too late. Because in the midst of suffering, our emotional attachment to that suffering is very strong. And no amount of logic and reasoning matters much when we are suffering. It's a lesson that we need to learn before suffering comes. That's why learning should be priority while there is still no suffering. Because when suffering comes, it's too late to teach people about suffering. Third reason why learning is priority, it allows us to handle God's Word correctly. You see, we're not just learning about God's Word. We're also learning how to read God's Word and how to understand God's Word. Paulitunit kong sinasabi na when we pastors preach, we're not just simply teaching you, but we're also teaching you how to read the Bible on your own. We're not just teaching you a truth, but we're teaching you how to read the Bible for yourself as well. When we are teaching here, we are showing you where we get our points, how you can see our points from the passage itself, 
And thereby you, when you have your own devotion, you know how to handle the word of God correctly. Now understand, in 2 Timothy, we are reminded that we are to handle God's word correctly and that we have no reason to be ashamed. And that's a problem because there are so many quotes sprouting out left and right. And these quotes basically comes from a mishandling of God's word. I remember a time when there was this pastor who came to our church and he, she, was, she was teaching us that we are to read the word of God because the word of God is very important. It is the word of God. And she went on to say, it is God. And we were shocked. We were shocked that she was saying that the Bible is God. And when we start asking her, why you say that? She said, look at the Bible. The Bible says in John 1.1, and that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, the Word is God. Therefore, the Bible is God. You see, this is a mishandling of the Word of God because she never understood that John 1, 1, the word Word in John 1, 1 is referring to Jesus Christ and not the Word of God or the Bible. It's referring to Jesus. And therefore, we have to be careful how we handle God's Word correctly. In the olden times, in the Middle Ages, the Catholics, they never allowed anyone to read the Bible. That's why in the 15th century and the 14th century, during those times, the Bibles were only in Latin. The common men cannot understand Latin. And the common men are not allowed to read the Bible. Because the Catholics, they were afraid that when the common men started reading the Bible, they would not understand the Bible and they might come up with different cultic ideas. Maling paniniwala. And so they just simply forbade everyone from reading the Bible. When Martin Luther became the leader of the Reformation, one of his proponents, one of the things that he was fighting for was the Bible should be taught to everyone that they may learn to read it for themselves. That's why Martin Luther was among those who translated the Bible and uh, was one of the very first to translate the Bible into a different language for the common people to read. Uh, if you remember, uh, Martin Luther, he translated the Bible into uh, German so that the common German people can start reading the Bible for themselves and learn the scriptures. Sad to say, Many people today who do not put emphasis into the learning of the Word of God are quoting the Bible wrongly. And it is producing a lot of false Christians. It is producing a lot of self-centered Christian. I believe na yung mga, what we call prosperity gospel is a mishandling of God's Word. And basically, these prosperity gospels are producing Christians who are very self-centered, that God should be providing for me everything I want and need. Why? Because they misunderstood the scriptures. They never studied the scriptures properly. Learning is important. Learning is important because it teaches us how to handle the word of God correctly. Lastly, learning is important because it also equips us to detect and confront false teachings and superstition, superstition belief, superstitious beliefs. You see, it's not, it not only helps us handle God's word correctly, but it also helps us detect whenever false teaching comes into our church. And not only does it help us detect the false teaching, it also helps us to confront. Question, how many of us are confident that when we hear a false teaching, we are so confident that we would confront it because we know it is wrong and we know the scriptures well enough to show that person why we say that he is wrong? If you cannot answer that question properly, then chances are you still need to focus a lot. Of, you, you need a lot of learning. A lot of times, Christians, when they became Christians, they're just simply satisfied and they don't care about learning anymore. We forget that we are disciples. The word disciple basically means, uh, comes from the Greek word mathetes, which literally means learner. As Christians, we are supposed to be lifelong learners. We continue to learn. 
The last reason why we have to prioritize learning is because it strengthens our hope in eternity. It teaches us not to look at this world, but to look at the world that is to come. It teaches us that the world to come is real. This world is temporary, and one day everything we have here in this world, they will fade away. But you see, temporal things are tangible. And that's why many times we focus on the tangible things and forget the eternal things which are intangible. But when we are properly taught, when we are properly learned in the scriptures, we learn to look forward. Um, as the book of Hebrews says, we look, we look forward to the city that was not built with hands, the city that has no foundations. We look forward to eternity. A Christian who is into the Word of God is a Christian who is always hopeful for the next life. Not this life, but the next life. Only if you are well equipped in the scriptures. And that's why it's very important because our hope as Christians is not in this world. But we fail to understand that if we don't know our scriptures well. Brothers and sisters, clearly for the apostles and the early church, learning is one of the bare essentials of the church. They understood that it's important. They understood that learning should be prioritized. They understood the benefits of learning within the church. And that's why they focus on learning. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, when the Bible says they devoted themselves, it was not just the apostles devoted to teaching, but the church itself devoted to listening and learning from the apostles. It's one thing to listen to the apostles. It's altogether another thing to learn from them. Because a lot of us, we've listened to so many messages. But the question is, how much have we learned? We've been attending so many Bible studies, but how much have we learned? We've been reading so many books, but how much have we learned? Because those two are two different things. The Bible says they devoted themselves. When you talk about devotion, there's that effort that was exerted. There was that focus. There was that unshakable steadfastness into the Word of God. It was not just listening. It was really absorbing what they hear and what they learn. Brothers, the apostle, for the apostle of the early church, learning is one of the bare essentials. You take away everything from the, from the church, you cannot take away learning. Because learning is one of the most essential aspects within the church. And the, question, and the better question right now is, how passionate are you about learning about your faith? How passionate are you in learning about your faith? With all the resources available for us today, the internet, we have so many access to the internet. We have so much access to the resources, the articles, the researches in the internet. We have so many books printed in our generation today. We have so many podcasts that are created about Christ, about Christianity. How passionate are you about a life of continuous learning about your faith? With all the resources available to you, how passionate are you about devoting yourself to learning about your faith even deeper? The key word here is the word passion, to be passionate why? Without it, learning can e easily become a bore. Without passion, learning can, be easy, can become easily a bore. It will be boring to just keep learning and learning if you don't enjoy what you are learning. I remember when I was in high school, one of the most hated subjects of mine was social studies. I didn't like social studies when I was in high school. Well, for one thing, I'm having a hard time in Filipino subject. I, I have a hard time speaking Filipino. I have a hard time reading Filipino books. And it so happened that when I was in high school, social studies were all in Filipino. And I hate Filipino. I, 
I hate Filipino. And because of that, I was struggling with social studies because first and foremost, it was in Filipino language. And not only that, our social studies teacher did not know how to teach social studies. Instead of telling us the implications of what went on in the past, we were asked to memorize details about the past. We were asked to memorize the complete name of, his, of our heroes. Um, for me, that would be acceptable. But here's the unaccept uh, unacceptable part. We have to memorize all their birth dates. Not just birth not just birthday, but birth dates, the month, the year, the month, the day, and the year. We have to memorize all their birth dates, and I don't see the point of doing that. Not only are we to memorize their birthday, we are to memorize the name of their wives. We are to memorize the name of their parents. And I don't really see the point of doing that. And not only that, in social studies, we were also required to memorize all those names of secretaries of the cabinet, who is the secretary of Department of Health, who is the secretary of Department of Education, who is the secretary of Department of this, Department of that. And it so happens that every now and then they change, they are replaced by the president. Can you imagine we just memorize all these names, then come examination time, what we memorize is already obsolete, simply because they have already been replaced. And it just becomes very frustrating for us students who are learning, especially because we don't enjoy learning it. And here's the funny thing. I have, a, I have a classmate who is actually enjoying social studies. I cannot understand how he could enjoy all this, but he does. And for him, he's enjoying every minute of social studies while I was falling asleep. The difference he was passionate about history, and I was not. He was passionate about history, and I was not. And here's the clincher. When it comes to math, it's the opposite. I was very passionate about math, and this guy could not even begin to comprehend what the teacher is talking about in front. <laughs> you see, passion plays a very important deal when it comes to learning. What is true with social studies, what is true with math, is also true with our faith. Are you passionate about your faith? If you are passionate about your faith, let me tell you, you don't need a pastor in the church. You will continue growing. You don't need to have a teacher. You don't need to have a discipler. You will grow on your own. You will search out books. You will search out seminars. You will search out learning. If you are passionate about the truth, if you are passionate about your faith, if you are passionate about Jesus Christ, Sad to say, many Christians claim to be passionate about Jesus Christ. But if you look at their lives, you find that this is not really true. There's really no evidence to point to the fact that they are really serious about Christ. That they are really passionate about Christ. Brothers and sisters, how passionate are you about learning your faith? How passionate are you about learning your faith? I remember when I was in college... I was living with my uncle and auntie, and every time I come home, it was around, when I was at home at around 7 to 7.30, my uncle and aunties, they were watching TV. And because they were occupied with the television set, I, had no, I could not watch TV because I don't really like what they were watching. So I would go into my room. What I did is I bought myself a radio. And I started listening to Charles Swindoll's Insights for Living. I started listening to Haven of Rest. I started listening to Back to the Bible. I started listening to um, John MacArthur's Grace to You. And throughout those years, those four years, every weekday night, I was tuned in to the radio. No one told me to do that. In fact, I actually have notes from my radio listening days. I took notes, I, I wrote them down, and I was actually growing in spite of I don't have a home church here in Manila when I was new here because I came from Tacloban. But I was growing as a Christian in spite of not being active in any church. I was attending church, where uh, I was attending a worship service at UECP, but that's it. 
but I was continually growing because of my own effort. I was searching out lessons I could learn. I was listening to the radio every night on DZAS. My sisters, how passionate are you about the truth? Because here's the clincher. If you are not into the truth, then the church, or at least part of the church, is not into the truth. Why? Because you make up the church. Because you make up the church. My sisters, if you are not into the truth, then a part of the church is not into the truth. My sisters, are we as a church into the truth? And that question goes to all each and every one of us. Are we into the truth? Do we do our devotions even when no one is looking? Do we seek out the truth? Do we enjoy learning new things about our faith? Recently, I'm really happy with our, with, with, the, with our church. Because recently, I, be, I, I have seen a spike in interest in our in, in our Bible study, people are asking questions, and people are writing me and asking me questions. And I begin to see something good is happening in spite of this pandemic. Um, somehow, many more, more of our church members are able to attend our Bible study nowadays. And not only are they simply attending, but they're actually inviting for the very first time. Inviting new people to join our Bible studies. And I thank God for them. I thank God for them. But here I begin to see that we are finally awakening our passion for the truth. I mean, I've been doing Bible studies with our church members for so many years. And I have not seen this kind of excitement these last few months, these last few weeks. This excitement is very different. I hope personally that I'm encouraged, I'm inspired to prepare even better because of the encouragement that I see um, in, your, in the excitement of these people. And no matter what stage you are in in your spiritual life, you will always need learning. Whether you're old, you're an old Christian or you're a new Christian, you need to continue to learn. You need to continue to learn. You should never stop learning. The Bible often compares learning to food or the truth to food. The Bible talks about the, the Word of God being like a milk that is being given to babies for their nourishment. And the Bible also compares the truth to, to meat that is given to adults who can chew for themselves. You see, the Bible is pointing out one very important thing. Just as we should not be without food for long stretches of time. So too, as Christians, we should not go without learning the truth for long stretches of time. As Christians, we should always be learning something new. We should always be passionate about reading our scriptures. We should be passionate about seeking the Word of God, learning more about the Word of God. Buy a Christian book. Listen to podcasts. If you need suggestions, message me and I'll give you suggestions on what to listen to. Libre naman lahat yan. You want to read books, you don't know which books to, to, to read, talk to me. I'm more than happy to give you the time to seek out which books would be good for, for, for learning more about our faith, to get us excited and passionate about learning about Jesus Christ. In, in conclusion, let me share this with you. This is my Tuesday Bible study group. This is my Tuesday Bible study group. Um, if you look at this picture, chances are you don't recognize anyone from this picture. Because this picture, this group of people are basically not from Makati Hope. They are not from our church. This group of people last year simply called me up and said, Pastor, we want to learn more about the Bible. Can you lead us in a Bible study? Some of them uh, are a member of one or two churches. Uh, I know this 
Uh, three of them are a member of a church, but the rest uh, don't have a church that they go to. But here's the interesting thing. They came up to me and said, Pastor, can you lead us in a Bible study? And I said, sure. So I started a Bible study with them. And it's been one year. It's been one year and it's been going on. And nakakatuwa because they're very excited about the Bible study. Every Tuesday morning, they would text and they would text one another and say, see you tonight, be there. Um, our Bible study, see you tonight. And andyan yung excitement. Andyan yung excitement. And I thank God for them because as I continue to teach them, I myself get excited um, with truth. I continue to study the Word of God. And it also challenges me to know more just as I'm doing with my Thursday Bible study group with you. And I hope we would have this attitude, that we would continue to have the passion to continue learning about our God. Because indeed, there's, there's never a good time to stop learning about God. Why? Because our God is infinite. You can never fully learn about God. All your life, you can never fully learn about God. Because He's infinite. That's why we can continue learning about God every day of our life until our last breath. We can continue to learn about God. We can never exhaust the knowledge of God. And that's why, brothers and sisters, it is my prayer that as Christians, we would remember this one important thing. Learning is a bare essential of the church. Of course, it doesn't end with learning. There are three or four more base bare essential for the church. And we'll continue discussing the second essential of the church next week. For now, I just want to focus on learning. And I pray and hope that we will never stop learning as Christians. That we will continue to have a passion to know more. Because indeed, He is beautiful and He deserves our focus. He deserves our mental energy. Focus on Him and Him alone. It is my prayer that we will continue to learn more and more about our God. Masters, once again this morning, uh, I pray and hope that you are safe. Our worship service ends here. And it's my prayer that each one of us will continue to walk according to God's Word and continue to live out a life that is passionate um, in learning the truth. Why don't we come to the Lord in prayer once more? Father, we thank you, Father, for the, today. We thank you, Father, for this reminder. We thank you, Father, because we know that we can never exhaust our knowledge of you. And it is our prayer, Father, that even as we understand this, may we continue to learn more about you, about our faith. Not just about our faith, but why we believe, O oh Lord. And Father, it's our prayer that each one of us will be marked by that desire to know, to learn. And if our church should be found, um, should be characterized by anything, let us be characterized by a people, as a people who are passionate about you. And it is my prayer, Father, that indeed each one of us will really take time to dive into your word and know more about you. We thank you because you're the God who reveals yourself to us, and you have revealed yourself through your word. Thank you, Lord, because without your word, we would not have known you. Without your word, we would be left in the dark. And we also ask for apology, for forgiveness, because although you have given us your word, you have revealed yourself through your word. A lot of times, Father, we don't put a lot of emphasis into your word. We neglect your word. We set aside the Bible. And we satisfy ourselves with being stagnant Christians. Forgive us, O Lord. And that's probably one reason why we are not effective in sharing the gospel with those who are lost. Why we are ashamed of our faith. Why we are ashamed of telling people about you. Father, it's my prayer that you would continue to instill upon us that desire and passion to learn. That we would commit ourselves to be devoted to the apostles' teachings, just as the first century church did. This is our prayer, Father. 
all for your glory. Now, Father, it is my prayer that as we end our worship, continue to be with us, continue to let your love and grace surround us, so that wherever we go, we can continue to be channels of your grace and peace, especially in this time of COVID-19, and when the people need your grace and love the most. Use us, Father, for your glory and honor. Once again, we lift up, Father, our sisters, uh, Auntie Aida and Sister Eden, who, who are uh, battling with COVID right now. We pray, Father, for your grace and protection and healing upon them as well. Once again, we give you thanks, we give you all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Our worship service ends here. God bless. Go in peace. May God's protection and love continue to surround you and your family. Have a blessed Sunday.